Greetings all, Last Outrider here with a supplementary video to my Mary Sue video on what is the gender of Space Marines, of which I said they have none because Space Marines are no longer human. They don't consider themselves human. And I thought this was abundantly obvious to anybody with even a cursory knowledge of Warhammer 40K. But apparently, no, there are a lot of guys out there with homoerotic fantasies that space marines are actually just hyper men on steroids. You're wrong. Whether you believe that prepubescent females can undergo the implantation process or not, one thing is absolutely clear. Space marines are not human. So, let's go through the implantation process. Now, I had to actually dig pretty far back to find out what it takes to create a space marine because believe it or not, nothing has been written on this subject since White Dwarf 98 from 19. 88, written by Rick Priestley, who, since he has absolutely nothing to do with Games Workshop anymore, as far as I understand, and if you want to retcon everything that has been written and added to 40K since 1988, you're going to be getting rid of a vast majority of 40K as you know it. If you want to know what Space Marines were like in Rick Priestley's day, I suggest you pick up the Ian Watson book, Space Marine, if you'd like a scatological adventure and see what they were like. So, here's the implants necessary to become an Astarte. Okay, there are 19 implanted organs, and they are very complicated, and because several of them only work properly or at all in the presence of other implants, the removal, mutation, or failure of one organ can affect the precise functioning of the others. Because of this, and the fact that each chapter's gene seed belongs to that chapter alone, different chapters display different characteristics and use different sets of implants and methods of implantation. Okay, so every chapter is unique. Chapters can't even swap gene seeds. Throughout the implantation process, the Marine must undergo various forms of conditioning in order for the implanted organs to develop and become part of the physiology. Below is a list of the complete set of implants used. Phases one through three can be introduced at the same time, ideally between the ages of 10 and 14 years of age. So here they go. This is why I'm saying they can be, you can start with either a prepubescent male or female, it doesn't matter, because let, let's really just listen to what these implants are. And you tell me which one of them do you think couldn't be placed into either gender. Phase one, secondary heart. The simplest and most self-sufficient of implants. Allows a space marine to survive, his other heart being damaged or destroyed, and to survive in low oxygen atmospheres. Phase two, osmodella. A small, complex, tubular organ. The osmodella, or osmo whatever, secretes hormones that both affect the ossification of the skeleton and encourages the forming of bone growths to absorb ceramic-based chemicals that are laced into the marine's diet. This drastically alters the way a space marine bones grow and develop. Two years after this implant is first put in, the subject's long bones will have increased in size and strength, along with most other bones. The rib cage will have been fused into a solid mass of bulletproof interlocking plates. Okay? So that right there means looking at it to start day is not going to be looking at a human. No rib cage. 
Next, phase three, the biscopia. Oh, this is the important one. This small circular organ is inserted into the chest cavity and releases hormones that vastly increase the muscle growth throughout the Marine's body. It also serves to form the hormonal basis for many of the other later implants. Okay? So that's where Estarte hormones come from. That's where they come from. A phase three implant. And I'm also guessing that it is at that time they would remove any other organs that would secrete hormones to interfere with this. Ergo, sex organs. Next, the hemostamen, phase four, implanted into the circulatory system. This tiny implant not only increases the hemoglobin content of the subject's blood, making it more efficient at carrying oxygen around the body, and making the subject's blood a bright red. It also serves to monitor and control the actions of phase two and phase three implants. Phase five, Lerman's organ. A liver-shaped organ about the size of a golf ball. This implant is placed within the chest cavity and connected to the circulatory system. It generates and controls Lerman cells, which are released into the bloodstream if the recipient is wounded. They attach themselves to leukocytes in the blood and are carried to the site of the wound. Whereupon contact with air, they form a near instant patch of scar tissue, sealing any wounds the Space Marine may suffer. Phase 6 The Catalepsian Node, or Catalepsian Node. Implanted into the back of the brain. This pea-sized organ influences the circadian rhythms of sleep and the body's response to sleep deprivation. If deprived of sleep, the catalepsian node cuts in. The node allows a marine to sleep and remain awake at the same time by switching off areas of the brain sequentially. This process cannot replace sleep entirely but increases the Marine's survivability by allowing perception of the environment whilst resting. This means that a Space Marine needs no more than four hours of sleep a day and can potentially go for two weeks without any sleep at all. Now, here's a note, that was 1988. As we now know, after, with the creation of the Codex Astartes and the, and the uh, Horus Heresy, Space Marines actually only need one hour of sleep a day. So there's a little change right there for you. And uh, they can actually go without sleep at all. I think there was one story where they said they went like 267 days without sleep. So things have changed. Phase 7. The Priomnor. Priomnor? Okay. This is essentially a pre stomach that can neutralize otherwise poisonous or indigestible foods. No actual digestion takes place in the Priomnor as it acts as a decontamination chamber placed before the natural stomach in the body's system and can be isolated from the rest of the digestive tract in order to contain particularly troublesome intake. Phase 8 The Omophagia This implant allows a space marine to learn by eating. It is situated in the spinal cord 
but is actually a part of the brain. Four nerve bundles are implanted, connecting the spine and the stomach wall. Able to read or absorb genetic material consumed by the marine, the omophagia transmit the gained information to the marine's brain as a set of memories or experiences. It is the presence of this organ which led to the various flesh-eating and blood-drinking rituals for which the Astarte are famous. Well, at least, were famous. Now, apparently, the flesh terrors are a offshoot chapter of Blood Angels, but back in 1988, they were their own independent chapter. And the Blood Angels were their own, and Astarte eating humans for fun was a day-to-day -day ritual, as they said, for which they are famous for. As well as giving names to such chapters, such as Blood Drinkers and Flesh Terrors. Whatever happened to the Blood Drinkers? Who knows? Over time, mutations in this implant have given some chapters an unnatural craving for blood or flesh. Obviously, this part has been completely retconned. Phase 9, the multi-lung. This additional lung activates when a space marine needs to breathe in low oxygen or poisoned atmospheres. And even water. Yes, space marines don't drown. They can breathe underwater, or could breathe underwater in 1988. The natural lungs are closed off by a sphincter muscle associated with the multi-lung, and the implanted organ takes over breathing operations. It is highly efficient toxic dispersal system, toxin dispersal systems. Okay? Phase 10 the oculobe. This implant sits at the base of the brain and provides hormonal and genetic stimuli, which enable a marine's eyes to respond to optic therapy. This in turn allows the apothecaries to make adjustment to the growth patterns of the eye and the light receptive retinal cells. The result being that space marines have far superior vision to normal humans and can see in low light conditions almost as well as daylight. Phase 11, Lyman's ear. Not only does this implant make a space marine immune from dizziness or motion sickness, but also allows space marines to continuously filter out and enhance certain sounds. The Lyman's ear completely replaces a marine's original ear. It is externally indistinguishable from a normal human's ear. Phase 12, the sus-an membrane. Initially implanted above the brain, this membrane eventually merges with the recipient's entire brain. Ineffective without follow-up chemical therapy and training, but with sufficient training, a space marine can use this implant to enter a state of suspended animation, consciously or as an automatic reaction to extreme trauma, keeping the marine alive for years, even if he has suffered otherwise mortal wounds. Only the appropriate chemical therapy or autosuggestion can revive a marine from this state. The longest recorded period spent in suspended animation was undertaken by Brother Silas Ur of the Dark Angels, who was revived after, get this, 500 and 67 years. Oh, this is also a good one. The melanochromic organ. 
dealing with another good question about space marines. This implant controls the amount of melanin in the marine's skin. Exposure to high levels of sunlight will result in the marine skin darkening to compensate. It also protects the marines from other forms of radiation. So, to answer the question then about skin coloration of space marines, there you go. They will change to whatever color they need to change based upon radiation conditions and sunlight. That's that. So feel free to paint your marines any color you want. <clears throat> Next, the oolitic kidney, phase 14. In conjunction with the secondary heart, this implant allows a space marine to filter his blood very quickly rendering him immune to most poisons. This action comes at a price, however, as his emergency detoxification usually renders the marine unconscious while his blood is circulated at high speed. The organ's everyday function is to monitor the entire circulatory system and allow other organs to function effectively. This was actually interesting because it was used back in the early, early, early days of 40K as a weakness for Marines. If they are hit with sufficient high levels of toxins or poisons in their systems, it may not kill them, it will knock them out. You can knock a Space Marine unconscious. And I believe the first time I heard about this being used uh, was with... The Space Wolves, with their, uh, when they, they, they created some, I'm not going to call it alcoholic drink, but some drink which intoxicated or mimicked intoxication, and it was based upon the oolitic kidney. Basically, they could drink themselves into a stupor as they purified their blood. Phase 15, the Neuroglottis. This enhances a space marine's sense of taste to such a high degree that he can identify many common chemicals by taste alone. A marine can even track down his target by taste. Phase 16. The mu mucrinoid. This implant allows a space marine to sweat a substance that coats the skin and offers resistance to extreme heat and cold and can even provide some protection for the marine in a vacuum. This can only be activated by outside treatment and is common when space marines are expected to be fighting in a vacuum. There you go. So apparently you cannot just throw a space marine out into space. They must undergo some outside treatment, which then they secrete this mucranoid substance that coats the skin, and that protects them. Phase 17, Betcher's gland, consists of two identical glands implanted either into the lower lip alongside the salivatory glands or into the hard palate. The gland works in a similar way to the poison gland of venomous, venomous reptiles by synthesizing and storing deadly poison, which the space marines themselves are immune due to the gland's presence. This allows a space marine to spit a blinding contact poison. The poison is also corrosive 
and can even burn away strong metals given sufficient time. And everybody's favorite, ah, or second favorite, the progenoids, phase 18. There are two of these glands, one situated in the neck, the other within the chest cavity. These glands are vitally important and represent the future of the chapter as the only way, I'll say again, the only way new gene seed can be produced is by reproducing it within the bodies of the Marines themselves. This is the implant's only purpose. The gland absorbs genetic material from the other implanted organs. When they have matured, each gland will have developed a single gene seed corresponding to each of the zygotes which have been implanted into the marine. These take time, five years in the first case, ten in the latter, to mature into gene seed. The gene seed can be extracted and used to create more space marines. So, the first grand implanted into the neck matures in five years. The second one implanted into the chest matures in ten years. Which means if a space marine is killed within five years, uh, they're not getting anything from it. <clears throat> Phase 19. The Black Carapace. The most distinctive implant. It resembles a film of black plastic that is implanted directly beneath the skin of the Marine's torso in sheets. It hardens on the outside and sends invasive neural bundles into the Marine's body. After the organ has matured, the recipient is then fitted with neurosensors and interface points cut into the carapace's surface. This allows a space marine to interface directly with his power armor, which answers your question about who can use space marine power armor. You cannot without the black carapace, which means if you were to look at the chest of any space marine, it would be a big black carapace armored chest. So basically, even if they're not wearing power armor, they're still wearing carapace armor. And this is the interface with their power armor. But we're not done here, people. No. Conditioning. Chemical treatment. Until his initiation, a Marine must submit to constant tests and experiments. The newly implanted organs must be monitored very carefully, imbalances corrected, and any sign of maldevelopment treated. This chemical treatment is reduced after completion of the initiation process. But it never ends. Marines undergo periodic treatment for the rest of their lives in order to maintain a stable metabolism. Marine power armor suits contain monitoring equipment and drug dispensers to aid in this, which is why they never take off their armor typically. Space Marines are not a self-sufficient organism. They must constantly undergo metabolic adjustment or their organs start failing. Hypnotherapy. As the super-enhanced body grows, the recipient must learn how to use its new abilities. Some of the implants, specifically phase 6 and 10 implants, can only function once correct hypnotherapy has been administered. Hypnotherapy is not always as effective as chemical treatment, but it can have substantial results. If a Marine can be taught how to control his own metabolism, his dependence on drugs is lessened. The process is undertaken in a machine called 
a hypnomat. Marines are placed in a state of hypnosis and subjected to visual and oral stimuli in order to awaken their minds to their unconscious metabolic process is. Training. Physical training stimulates the implants and allows them to be tested for effectiveness. Although, I've never heard of that. Indoctrinization. Hmm. Just as their bodies receive 19 separate implants, so their minds are altered to release latent powers within. These mental powers are, if anything, more extraordinary than even the physical powers described above. For example, a Marine can control his senses and nervous systems to a remarkable degree and can consequently endure pain that would kill an ordinary person. A Marine can also drink, think, and react at lightning speeds. Memory training is an important part of the indoctrinization, too. Some Marines develop photographic memories, or today it would be called holographic memories. Obviously, Marines vary in intelligence, as do other men, and their individual mental abilities vary in degree. After all of these implantations and alterations to the human body, there is a serious debate as whether or not space Marines are human. While they undoubtedly serve humanitably, they are at least two meters tall, can breathe poison, and eat through metal. Now I ask you, why, why would any of this process be impossible to implant into a prepubescent female? Uh, with the end result still being a space marine. I see no reason why not. There was one thing that I could find that supported it, and that was in the recruitment process, in which Rick Priestley wrote that one of the most selected four, here it is, among the most valued traits in a recruit are aggression <laughs> and psychotic level killer instinct. And it is true. Most psychotics are male. So I guess, I don't know if that's a, a, a good thing, but you need to be psychotic before you're selected to be a space marine. If you're not psychotic, you just don't have what it takes. So I don't know if that's an advantage. You have to be crazy first. Anyways, that's what it takes to be. Those are the implantations. That is the process. And I think that now, after 1988, going up to today, it is perfectly acceptable to say that these 19 organs can be planted into a prebubescent human. Period. Granted, it has to be a psychotic human. But nonetheless, just a prepubescent human. Let's see who disagrees now. Until then, bye. <laughs>